I'm glad to introduce our young speaker for today, Mr. Eugene Lawrence R. Logatok. Eugene is currently a university research associate at the Museum of Natural History, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and he is involved as a project staff of the DOST NICER funded uh, Center for Cave Ecosystems Research Program or our recently uh, launched CAVES program. He obtained his uh, BS Biology major in Ecology and MS Botany, um, specializing in plant taxonomy from UPLB in 2016 and 2019, respectively. His research interests um, focus on bryophyte taxonomy, diversity, and ecology. Um, in addition to this, he is particularly fascinated by indigenous folklores, continental and Asian philosophies, and of course with lichens. Friends, let us all welcome Eugene Logato. Eugene, good morning. Good morning, Pokoya Flor. Uh, thank you po, for that great introduction. So, good morning. Mm -hmm. Let me just share my slide. So, good morning, everyone. Maayong buntag sa tanan. Uh, magandang umaga sa lahat at naimbag na ang sapa kada kayo amin. So for this morning, we'll be looking into uh, the bryophyte flora of Luzon and the bryophyte flora of Palawan Island. So this uh, seminar is entitled Lumot Chronicles, Re-exploring the bryophyte story of Luzon and Palawan Island in the Islands in the Philippines. So um. I plan this talk not to be too much technical, so ano lang siya, uh, light lang siya. So for, uh, for this morning, we will be looking into an introduction to the bryophyte, and then the Philippines with the hand lens, and then we will be looking into some stories, so tatlo yun. So I will be discussing them later, and then a summary and some concluding remarks. So, uh, First thing, we have this Tagalog term called the lumot. So it's very familiar, no? But actually, there are many more terms across the Philippines for lumot. So one would be a variation of the spelling lumot. And then other one would be humot. This is in uh, Batanes. And then another would be bagu, which is the general term in the Cordillera. And then one term would another term from the Cordilleras would be uh, I think this uh Kurakot, which is a term used for uh, bryophytes and lichens in general that are not attached to stones and are not in water. And then you have your pokater, which is a term used for uh, bryophytes, lichens, or algae, which are attached on stones or along waterways. And then another term that I found fascinating is porakot si fatang. Uh, fatang means mature pine tree and porakot means uh, a lichen or a moss. So this pertains to your usnya. It is a white, uh, it's a white lichen attached to your pine tree in the Cordillera. So scientifically, the term lumut means your uh, algae, first of all. And then another would be your lichen. And then lastly, the bryophyte. So what are bryophytes? So bryophytes are spore producing for, for kilohydric non-bacterial land plants with a dominant gametophyte generation. So I think that's a bit complicated. So let's dissect this definition. So spore producing, um, so basically it produces spores and not seeds. And then when we say land plants, they are, uh, they are the earliest diverging groups of land plants and they evolved from Herophycean algae. And they are characterized with the other land plants with these characteristics. And then among, uh, the bryophytes are divided into three groups. You have your liverworts or the Marcanchophyta, the mosses or the bryophyta and the hornwort or the Anthocerotophyta. So the liverwort, um, seen here by, uh, this is Marcantia polymorpha or the sal a saloid liverwort. And then the saloid liverworts only comprise around 10% of the liverworts. 
And we, we also have the leafy liverwort, which comprise around 90% of that group. And then for the mosses, we have Spiridensrine wartii, which is a, quite a large moss. And then for hornworts, we have Dendrocero. So for some definition of terms. So the gametophyte is the gamete producing haploid generation. So uh, para mas madali pong matandaan, the gametophyte for the moss or for the bryophytes in general ay yung may dahon, the one that possesses the leaves. So it begins as a spore, then germinates into a protonema, and eventually matures into the gametophore, which bears the gametanja. And then another would be your sporophyte, which is the spore-producing diploid generation composed of the foot, stalk, and capsule. So in this, in this uh, picture, this is the sporophyte. And then this is the gametophyte. So the foot is embedded in the gametophyte. Then you have the stalk and then the capsule at the tip. So the sporophyte is at least dependent on the gametophyte. So another term which sounds too technical would be your poikilohydry. Poikilohydry is the lack of capacity to maintain or and slash or regulate water content. And the state of hydration is controlled by the external environment. And you have this ability called desiccation tolerance. So what is desiccation tolerance? It is the ability of an organism to revive in the presence of water and to survive uh, long droughts. So example, may bryophyte ka, and then patakan mo lang ng tubig, uh, more or less, uh, marirevive siya agad. And then you have the term alternation of generation. So it is a reproductive cycle in which the haploid and diploid phase gave rise to each other in a continuous cycle. So for the life cycle of your bryophyte, here is a representative moss. So number one would be the spore germinates. And then upon the germination of spores, the protonemas will form. And from the protonema will rise the young gametophyte. When the gametophyte matures, it will produce a uh, the archegoniophore and then the anteridiophore, which would contain your anteridium and the archegonium, which produces your sperm and egg. So in the presence of water, the archegonium, particularly the neck part of the archegonium, will release compound that will trigger the release of sperms. So that, uh, there's a certain distance of, and proximity for this to occur. And then the sperm will then swim towards the egg, and then it will form a zygote. And then from that zygote, the sporophyte will arise. And upon maturity, it will release spores. So looking to the groups of the bryophyte, you have the liverwort. So these are approximately 7,300 species in 384 genera and 87 families worldwide, of which 504 species in 94 genera and 32 families in the Philippines. So there are 40 species and six varieties endemic, but I think this will be reduced in the future since um, no further revisions have been done on some species, particularly those published by Stephanie. And then you have three classes, the Haplometrioxida, Marcanchopsida, and Jungermanioxida. And you have a diverse morpho-anatomy. You have the saloid forms and the leafy forms. So for the saloid forms, we have some representatives here. This is Marcantia polymorpha with its gemmate cups, which is a form of asexual reproduction. And then this is uh, the Murtiera hirsuta with its, uh, uh, with its sporophyte. And then for the leafy forms, we have a species of Schistochila and a species of Legionaceae attached on the leaves of uh, Pinanga. And then I haven't identified this one yet, but it is also a form of leafy liverwort. And then this is Purosha gigantia. So when we say with or without internal differentiation, it simply means that when you cross-section the, uh, the thallus of the saloid liverwort, 
Um, with differentiation would simply mean that there are different types of cells that are present, and then without differentiation would mean that um, the cell types are uniform. And then you also have divided and undivided leaves. So we, we, I, I will show you some of these later. So one of the characteristics of uh, leafy liverworts that differentiate them from the mosses would be the presence of oil bodies. So the, uh, basically these are um, membrane bound, uh, um, th these are membrane bound, which contains oil. And then moving on, we have the mosses. The mosses are approximately 12,500 species in 850 genera and 110 families worldwide, and around 800 species in 240 genera and 56 families in the Philippines. So currently there are 39 species and six varieties endemic to the country. So there are eight classes of bry bryophyta. You have Tachyopsida, which is not present in the Philippines. Uh, Spagnopsida, represented by Spagnum, this one. And then Andreopsida and Andre Andreobryopsida are not present in the Philippines. Also Edipodioxida and Tetrapidopsida. And then you have Polytrichopsida, which is represented here by Pogonatum ceratum subspecies Macrophidum, and the highly diverse Bryopsida, which is represented here by Eucobryum habensi, uh, Physidens, Hypnodendron dendroides, and Ectropotetium. So we will see more of these species later. So among the Bryopsida, there are two major groups the Acrocarpus and Sorocarpus mosses. So when we say Acrocarpus moss, the sporophyte is located terminally, nasa tip. And then when we say Pleurocarpus moss, the sporophyte is located laterally. So again, kapag Acrocarpus, terminal yung position ng sporophyte. Kapag Pleurocarpus, lateral. And then my special type tayo ng Acrocarpus moss, which is the Cladocarpic mosses or the Cladocarpus mosses. So Cladocarpus, uh, basically they form a specialized branch in which at the tip of that branch, the sporophyte will arise. So for the hornworts, this is the smallest group of bryophytes around 215 species in 14 genera and five families worldwide, of which 14 species and one subspecies in six genera and two families are in the Philippines, and two, two species are endemic. However, I doubt that these two endemic species will retain their species status. So they haven't been revised recently. So I think it needs revision. And then you have two classes, the Leosporotus, Leosporocerotopsida and the Antocerotopsida. And they have, they are basically saloid in form. So you have some forms which are rosette or ribbon shaped. And that's why they're called hornworts because they have horn like sporophytes, which lack seta and diseases in one or two lines. So as you can see here in Peoceros oreganus, the sporophyte diseases in two lines. So looking into the bryophyte flora of the Philippines, so we, uh, we only have a total of 1,318 species, many of which are still unrevised. So I think it needs updating. So uh, from that 1,318, we have 504 species of liverwort, 800 mosses, and 14 hornworts. And then of which 40 species of liverworts are endemic, 39 species of mosses and two species of hornwort, a total of 81, which would account to 6.15% endemism. But I think this will go down probably in the future. So just to highlight the endemic species of the Philippines, you have here Drepanolidunia dentistipula. So this was uh, published by Stephanie in 1913. So it is a epiphyllus liverwort. When we say epiphyllus liverwort, um, it grows on leaves of other plants. 
and it is a Luzon endemic. So it's only known from a type specimen collected by C.B. Robinson in Mount Binuwang in Panta Kevin province. So as you can see in the details of this uh, publication by Dr. Zhu, uh, this is your, this is the leaf of Japanulujunia dentistipula, showing its lobe and then its lobule. And then looking at E, this is the under leaves or the amphigastria, which is bilobe. And, and these, um, these characteristics are used in the taxonomy of liverwort, including the presence of this in large cells in the leaves, which are called ocelli. Another endemic species of uh, liverwort would be your Drepanolugunia bakeri, by her, uh, published by Herzog in 1930. So it is a epiphilus liverwort. Again, it grows on leaves. Um, the type specimen actually was actually uh, described from a specimen growing in a, I think it was a phytos from the summit of Mount Makili. And it is a Luzon endemic only known in three localities, one in Mount Polis, one in Mount Makiling, and one in Mount Bulusan. So given that it only has three localities, so less than five localities, and then the habitat is declining, so it was classified by the IUCN as endangered. So this, um, uh, these pictures of the Panelu Junior Baker, Bakeri was uh, taken from a specimen collected by Dr. Pancho way back in the 1977. And it was determined by the Japanese uh, bryologist Kamimura. So among the mosses, you have your Merilubryum pagronioides, published by Broderus in 1908. So it is a epiphytic moss, and it is quite small, so it's hard to look at look for this in the field. And currently, it is only known from three localities in the Cordillera region, particularly in Bontoc. So I don't specifically know where in Bontoc this is, but based on records, Bontoc lang yung nakalagay. And then in Mount Data, and then in Mount Pulag. So similar to Drepanolidunia bakeri, um, it is classified as endangered by the IUCN. So formerly, the genus Merilubryum was an, a Philippine endemic. But um, it was di discovered in 2008 that the genus also occurs in uh, Papua New Guinea. And the new species of this genus was Merilubryum tanyanum, named after the late Dr. Benito Tan. And then uh, just looking into this diversity of mosses in the Philippines, so I just want to pay homage to the early botanists who worked and studied and collected these uh, specimens for research and uh, for contributing to what we know today. So one would be Adolf, uh, Adolf Elmer or ABE Elmer. And then another would be Elmer Drew Merrill. So these two are perhaps the most prolific uh, collectors of their day. And then one would be uh, one of the workers for Philippine mosses would be Victor Ferdinand Broderus. Um, he is from Finland. And um, many of um, E.D. Merrill's specimens were sent to VF Broderus for study. And he described many species of mosses from the Philippines. And then another worker would be uh, Robert Statham Williams from New York. Um, he, wor uh, he worked and collected on many sites in the Cordillera region. And then uh, I think all Filipino biologists should know this person. This is Edwin Gunting Bartram. And so far, he is the only person who has published uh, working flora for the Philippine mosses. So this was published way back 1939. And then for the labor work, we have Victor, uh, Victor Felix Schiffner. Um, he worked on, um, he was one of the editors, editors of uh, Dinator Lickens Lansen Familian by Engler and Frantel. So he worked for the hepatophage. And similarly, Victor Broderus also worked for some species of, uh, for some groups of mosses in that treatment. 
And then another would be Theodore Carl Julius Herzog. Um, he was the one who described Drepanulo Junior Baker Rice. And then one would be Franz Berdoun from the Netherlands. Um, his work uh, established, uh, established uh, how to taxonomically interpret many liver work groups. So for among Filipinos, we have we have two early workers. We have Do we have Dr. Romaldo M. Del Rosario. He is formerly from at the National Museum, but I think he is currently in USC. And Dr. Del Rosario also worked on Moses. And then among the labor work, he worked on the groups Herbertus, which, uh, which is, uh, belongs to the uh, family Herbertaceae. And then we have the late Dr. Benito Ching Tan. Uh, he died last 2016, and he worked on the Moses of the, not only of the Philippines, but of tropical Asia and even temperate Asia, including China and portions of, uh, I think, Russia and Mongolia. So to start this talk, so enough with all those formalities. So this will just be a sim somewhat a simple travel log, but it's a bit scientific. So part one of our, or rather, tour would be Tales from Bukid Milno. So Bukid Milno, I will explain later what that means. So in a nutshell, we will be looking into the bryophytes of Palawan. So based on the work of Dr. Tan way back in 1996, there are currently 192 species in 88 genera of mosses. And basically the information on the liverwort and hornwort are still scattered. So there is a one. There is one checklist by Dr. Benito Tan and Zen Iwatsuki on the labor works of the Philippines. I think it was published in 1986, and it needs updating. And then you also have uh, scattered information on taxonomic revisions as well as in herbarium specimens. So, uh, one example of herbarium specimen from Palawan would be a collection by Dr. Will Roezo from Mount Salakot in Palawan. This was collected way back 1979 and determined by the Japanese bryologist in Kitagawa in 1985. So, so far no one has uh, uh, consolidated information on the labor work of Palawan. And then according to Dr. Tan, the the Palawan served as one of the refugia for the survival of Sirictora. So remember, in the last Pleistocene Ice Age, basically, walang, uh, walang physiologically available water. So it's dry. So these Sirictora were perhaps once widespread until the last Ice Age. And then after the last Ice Age, when the tropics eventually became wet, nag-receive yung distribution nila and so far, in the Philippines, sa Palawan na lang sila nag occur Or many of them are occurring in Palawan. And perhaps probably in Sambales. And then many areas in Palawan still need to be explored. So one of these areas would be uh, Bukid Milno. So Bukid Milno, in common terms or in what, in what uh, common literature says is basically Mount Mantalingahan. So Bukid Milno, so Bukid means mountain in the indigenous Palawan language. And Milno simply means a, a smooth or gradual. As you can see, the slope of the mountain or the ridge of the mountain is smooth. Hence the name Bukid Milno. So this uh, mountain is around 2,100 meters above sea level. And for the field work that we conducted, we surveyed the tropical semi-evergreen semi rainforest, tropical lower mountain rainforest over ultramatic substrate, so combination to ng dalawang forest formation, and then, or rather overlap, and then you have your tropical upper mountain rainforest over ultramatic substrate, 
and then the tropical subalpine forest also over ultramatic substrate. So in July 23 to 29, 2019, uh, we conducted a survey in the Ransang Trail, which is in Rizal, Palawan. So this is a back trail. So for the things to summit, bumalik din agad kami. And then uh, on prior to the lockdown, January 4 to 11, or whether in prior na pumutok yung Mount Taal. So we went, uh, we took the Malis Trail. This is a traverse. This is in Brooks Point, and then pagdating sa summit, sa Ransang kami, bumaba. So this is, the, this is the team. So the project is Enhancing Conservation Actions in Mount Mantalingahan Protected Landscape. And this is uh, funded by the Forest Foundation Philippines through its Grantee the Proceeds Development Association. So this is our team. Uh, uh, last January 2019, and the project is headed by Sir Pat Malabigo. So this team is composed composed of botanists and an entomologist, as well as the local field guides from Aribongos and Ransang. So this photo is taken by uh, Professor Zerilyn Meneses Adorador from IDS. She is also one. She is also with us that time. And then. So during field work, um, if two is better than one, then three is better than two. So during that field work, pag nag field work kami, tatluhan kapag nag hike And we have this informal group, which we call Samahang OPM. So it includes, this is Prof, uh, Professor Jiro Adorador, and then Professor Zerilyn Meneses Adorador, and then this is me. So OPM, Original Pinoy Music ba? So, of course, in the laboratory, we always listen to OPM, actually most of the time. But it doesn't mean that, that OPM. So, it simply means Samahang Orchid, Palms, and Mosses. So, in the previous BSS, um, uh, Professor Z. Adorador actually discussed the orchid, and then Professor Jiro Adorador discussed the palms. So, ako naman ngayon. So another member of this team would be Ate Eileen Alcala. So she was not with us in Palawan, but hi Ate Eileen. So during that field work, we found many species of uh, bryophytes. So an example would be Shistochila. So I haven't, uh, I haven't ascertained the identification of this yet, but it's in the genus Shistochila. This is a leafy liverwort. And it is only found in the uh, tropical lower mountain rainforest of Mount Mantalingahan. And then you have the Cranoloma blumii, which is rather abundant in the area. And then you have this um, uh, quite large and fancy moss known as Leucobrium hovensi. So this is easy to spot in the field since it is uh, white and rather large. So among, in the lower elevation, we found this Rhizogonium spiniformis. So this is a part of Rhizogoniaceae. And then this bryum species was actually found in the summit of Mount Mantalingahan. And then another would be your Hypnodendron dendroides. So this uh, species of moss is also quite large and it resembles small trees. So, para kang may maliliit na gubat na tumutubo sa logs or sa mga bato. So, another species would be your Trismegistia calderensis, a member of Pelasia delphacii, and then a species of Ectroposition, and then a species of Acroporium. So, among the noteworthy uh, finds during that time, would be, your, would be the species Bertelia arundinifolia, Bartramiaceae. This is, uh, this haven't been recorded in Palawan yet, but it, uh, it is known to occur in Mindanao, Negros, and in Luzon. So uh, for Mount Mantalingahan, the nearest uh, locality of this species is in uh, Mount Kinabalu in Borneo. And then another species would be your Racometrium lanuginosum, 
this is Grim uh, Grimiasi, it grows on uh, rocks or uh, debris covered rocks. And it has this characteristic color when it's dry, so it's white. The, uh, since if you view this in the microscope, it has a very a long, it is very long peliferous. So when we say peliferous, uh, the leaves has a very thin hair-like extension. So when it's dry, it, look, it, it looks like this. So perhaps um, all those information that I presented more on scientific, um, those are the things which we can impart to the locals. So, and I find the locals very, uh, very, I find them very accommodating. They are very welcoming on new ideas. Um, they listen to scientists and that is very good. But um, one thing that I want to highlight in this talk, so I titled this subtopic, Tales from Bukid Milnu. So I think during field works, we should learn from the locals. So what are the things that we can learn from the locals? So I think more or less we can learn the culture, the worldviews, on how they value the mountain, local names, etc. So one would be, as I've explained earlier, Bukid Milnu. So when I ask the locals what the, what actually is the name of Mount Mantalingahan, they said Bukid Milnu. And I asked them, why, why did the mountain change its name? So why did it become Mantalingahan? So according to them, some hikers or mountaineers went to the mountain and then documented some uh, features of the mountain and then when they came back to their places they publicized the area as Mount Mantalingahan. So I, I rather I find that rather disrespecting to the locals because they've known Bukid they, they've known it as Bukid Milno for quite some time now. So why change the name? So I, just my opinion. And then you, you also have to learn on the sacred and forbidden area. So first of all when we conduct field work um, it's oh, basically we're not from there. So we, we have to know the local culture, their worldview, and what they consider sacred or forbidden. So in Mount Mantalingahan, we experienced, uh, uh, we experienced and learned about the sacred and forbidden areas or sacred and forbidden portions of the mountain. So when you say sacred, uh, sacred area, that portion of the mountain is inhabited by the guardians of the mountain. So basically these are rather neutral beings that needs to be respected. So I think they're neither good nor evil. So they, they're sometimes mischievous, but basically when you say sacred, it's something that should not be uh, uh, desecrated. And then when we say forbidden areas, these are areas inhabited by demons and evil entities. So uh, our local guide kept on reminding us that there are several areas which are forbidden because there had been cases in the past where, where some hikers would uh, desecrate some areas and um, go to forbidden areas and eventually they will get sick. So I think as, as a responsible researcher, we need to know this to respect the locals. And then for, for the forbidden areas, they have this concept of bungaw. So the bungaw is uh, it, uh, it's a type of demon that um, uh, there was one person who desecrated an area inhabited by a bungaw, and according to stories, uh, he suffered a unknown death. So that's according to stories, but it's interesting. So another concept that I've learned from them would be the concept of the panglima. So the panglima is a, it's, a, a view, uh, it's more of a local guide, a local justice or He's a local elder who settles disputes among, among, among neighbors, among family members. And basically, one panglima covers a certain bunglay. So a bunglay is, an, is the area which encompasses the human settlement, uh, the, uh, the farming areas, the agricultural areas. And usually, a bunglay is within a slope. So if the slope is facing east, and then it's bounded by ridges, then that certain bunglay is under a certain family, which is headed by a panglima. And then another would be the concept of uma. So the uma is basically kaingin. And then you have the banwa. So 
the word banwa is common, I think, in the central Philippines. So banwa simply means the settlement. And another would be your kulang banwa. So the kulang banwa is a long house where locals uh, meet together and celebrate weddings, uh, uh, certain events of the community. And uh, there are certain times that it serves as a health center for the locals. And then among the local names, you have your Pisa Pisa, which, is, uh, which pertains to Areca Vidaliana, it's a palm, and also to uh, Pinangale Pidota, which, uh, uh, which we currently, uh, which we published recently with uh, Dr. Edwino Fernando, Professor Giro Adorador, and Sir Pat Madabrigo. So Pinangale Pidota was previously re uh, reported only from Borneo, and it was found in Palawan. So another would be your soka. Soka is uh, rattan. So just one example. So this uh, product was made of soka. So it's made of rattan. So it's intricately made. So it's quite fascinating. And then another one would be your kubgan. Kubgan is actually a place which simply means a place where many uh, fruit bats fly. So in Tagalog, you call that kabugan. And many non-locals from there would pronounce it as kabugan. So these are just some of the things that we experience in that area. So I think, I really think as responsible researchers, we need to learn from the locals. So moving on, the next, the next would be Ascent of Labo in Dinatuman. So this title is somewhat reminiscent of uh, publications by Merrill and Fedor Yagor. And I, I, I copied a bit, of, a bit of it. So in a nutshell, biological activities in Mount Labo and vicinity can be uh, grouped into three. So you have in 1994, uh, Dr. William Groedo, uh, he is my master's advisor. Uh, he uh, he conducted an EIA in the former PNOC drilling site, and he collected some bryophytes. And then, when I uh, when I asked Sir Guezzo if I will, if uh, that I when I asked Sir Guezzo if he would allow me to work on the bryophytes, he gladly offered this specimen to me. So these formed the foundations of my thesis during my MSc. And these are currently deposited in Sir Groezo's personal herbarium. So another would be the collection of Dr. Virgilio Lenis in the northern and western slope. So the northern slopes would be in the municipality of uh, Labo, and then the western slopes would be in Quezon Province. And then his collections are currently in the Philippine National Herbarium in the National Museum. And then in 2018, I collected in the southern slopes of Mount Labo, including Mount Ginatungan. So this is Mount Labo. It has an elevation of 1,544 meters above sea level. And this is Mount Ginatungan, which, is, which has an elevation of 916 meters above sea level. So uh, during the conduct of my thesis, so first and foremost, we need to apply for a gratuitous permit. And then we conduct, uh, I conducted a site reconnaissance. And then I, uh, I, together with guides, we established a sampling plot and characterized the sampling locality. And then we collected, preserved, prepared, and identified some voucher specimens and did some data analysis. So I won't focus too much on the technicalities of my thesis, um, but rather I will just show you what I found there. So just a bit of information on the on my sampling. So I laid out one plot every 200 meters elevation in both Mount Ginatungan and Mount Labo. And these are along a trails and at least five meters away from trails. And then in collecting specimens, we use collection packets. So these are collection packets. And we only collect less than or equal to one third of the colony, and for rare species, only less than 10. So for the preservation of the specimens, 
we do air drying. And it usually takes two to three days para tuyong tuyo talaga siya. And then in the identification, we use compound microscopes, uh, taxonomic seeds and descriptions and identified herbarium specimens. So uh, I just want to share. As simula nung nag-start yung lockdown, so I brought home my microscope and converted my sala into sala slash kitchen into a makeshift biology laboratory. So desperate times require desperate measures. So and then we also have the identified herbarium specimen. So in this case, um, I'm showing you Japanali Junior Bakery. So these are pre-identified and I examined this at Kahu. I think that was 2018 or 2019. So for a brief uh, overview of the findings. So in the southern slope of Mount Labo, there are 73 species four subspecies and five varieties distributed in 40 genera and 21 families. And among these families, the most species rich is Kalimperaceae. So you will see a specimen of this later. And then we found out, uh, I, uh, we found out that there are uh, five species which are newly recorded for the Bicol region and two varieties. So I just uh, given the title ascent to labo uh, ascent ascent to labo in Ginatungan. So I just want to take you a bit on a biological tour to my uh, sampling areas. So the sampling areas are divided into five areas. So number one would be your agricultural areas. So in these agricultural areas, most of the mosses and the bryophytes would grow on the trunks of coconuts. So you have here um, uh, in micro, a microscopic view of the leaves of Mesiridium uh, fasciculatum, which is a member of Kalimperaceae. So uh, Kalimper uh, members of Kalimperaceae are characterized by these uh, hyaline cells or whitish cells at the base of their leaves. And then this, uh, uh, this particular genus of Kalimperaceae is creeping, unlike uh, other members of Kalimperaceae. And then you have your Macrometrium microstomum, which is a member of Orthotricaceae. Ortho so the, the differences in the shape of the shape and the, uh, the, sh uh, the shape and the length or the width of the cells between the between the distal portions of the leaf and the basal portions of the leaf are one of the characteristics of this group. So it's easy to identify them if you see these characteristics of cells. So that's for agricultural areas. So for the reforestation areas, so reforestation areas in Mount Labo are mainly found in areas which were formerly uh, drilling pad sites. So in my case, um, I was able to uh, visit one of these, which is just nearby the campsite. And many species also occur here. So um, majority of the species planted, three species planted for reforestation is your uh, Gymnostoma rumpiana, which is your Agohong bundok. And uh, many species of uh, bryophytes grow on them. So you have uh, Seropodon procus, which is also a member of Kalimperaceae. Among other members of Kalimperaceae, Seropodon crocus is quite unique in the presence of uh, red cells right above the hyaline cells or the whitish cells at the base. So if you microscope a specimen of Kalimperaceae and you've seen this uh, reddish, uh, reddish cells, then more or less it's Seropodon crocus. And then we also have Garuvalia picata which is a member of Tychomyaceae. This is a uh, quite large um, moss, uh, around two to three inches in, uh, in length, and it is clustering. So I, this is the leaves here. And then we have Acroporium lupum, which is a member of Sematophilaceae. So Sematophilaceae is characterized by the presence of this reddish cells at the basal angle. These are called alar cells.
and then for the vicinity of Angelina Falls, so I had the I had the luxury to have some swimming because there's a nearby falls in the camping site. So I also sampled some rheophytic bryophytes. So you have uh, uh, Pisidens geminiflorus, geminiflorus, which is a species of Pisidentaceae. So Pisident, uh, members of Pisidentaceae are characterized by the presence of this, uh, this leaves. So this is, uh, uh, there's this somewhat third flap on the leaves, I forgot the term. Uh, the vaginant lamina. So this is the, the presence of the vaginant lamina is characteristic of the Pisidentaceae. And then another would be Cyclodictium dumianum. So this is a member of Pilotricaceae. And uh, it, uh, the presence of leaf board, uh, linear borders in the leaves and the types of cells and the two costae here is characteristic of this group. And then one would be Pilonotis hastata. These are quite small bryophytes and sometimes they, they somewhat uh, they're somewhat grayish or sometimes uh, quite green. And they are they're usually growing on rocks. So for the tropical lowland evergreen rainforest, so we have a tropic Chiculipolium exiguum. This is a member of Nicaraceae. And then Pisidens javanicus, again a member of Pisidentaceae. And then Pogonatum nisii, a member of Polychicaceae. And then for the tropical lower and tropical upper mountain rainforest, we have a species which uh, there are some species which are rather restricted in that uh, habitat. So we have. Uh, Cyropodon spiritus, Calimperaceae. This is a member of Calimperaceae. And um, in the field, this looks like a, this, lo this resembles uh, centipedes, but they're quite small. And then you have Yucobrium sanctum. Here, this is a member of Yucobriaceae, and these are white mosses. And then another would be your extraposition this is a creeping moss. And then lastly, this Megistia calderensis bar rigida, which is a member of Elisha del Cassie. So I just would like to thank my guide during that time. This is Chuani Malate. So no, uh, uh, according to him, uh, he also guided Dr. Gruez way back in 1994. So it, uh, ito kami, this is in the summit of Mount Labo. And then lastly, for, for these sites, you have, I have this uh, quite, quite an unusual title. So aroma of overcooked inapoy. So inapoy is uh, cooked rice or sinain or uh, kanin. So in a nutshell, the Cordillera Central is contains the Luzon's highest mountains. So we have Mount Pulag, Mount Tabeo, Mount Akiki, and Mount Amuya. So Mount Pulag, Mount Tabeo, and Mount Akiki are in uh, are in Benguet. Uh, I think it's in uh, Benguet Ifugao border. And Mount Amuya is in the border of Ifugao and Mountain Province. And these are per, uh, the Cordilleras is are perhaps the most biologically explored areas in the Philippines. And they cater to, uh, it caters to temperate bryophytes with southern distributions reaching Southeast Asia, but uh, mainly uh, species from the Himalayas and parts of Japan. So my recent activities in the Cordilleras would be, I'm doing herbarium work, primarily in Tahu, and uh, I've, uh, I've, I've inventoried and examined some specimens collected from the CAR. And I did some reconnaissance and field work. And then we conducted lectures and workshops on introduction to 
bryophyte. So this lecture workshop, introduction on bryophyte, to bryophyte, um, it started as a casual request from a very good friend of mine, Dr. Jones Napalget from the United States. So he, uh, I once visited them and then he told me, uh, mo bang mag lecture sa ano sa plant taxo class ko? Eh, I was ready, so I lectured in his plant taxo class. I think that was in 2017, and then eventually it became regular. So I go to BSU, I think once a year, to do a lecture on an introduction to bryophyte in his class. And then prior to prior to the lockdown, uh, we also conducted uh, a lecture and a workshop in Tadaklan National High School. This is in Bardig Mountain Province. So to highlight the importance of the Cordillera Central in, uh, in most diversity in the Philippines. So in 1999, Benito Tan and then Iwatsuki uh, identified Mount Amuyao as one of the most diversity hotspots in Malaysia. So it contains 130 genera, 205 species, of which many are Philippine endemic. And this is probably one of the locations of Merilio Brian Pabranoides. And many of these are Himalayan and continental Asiatic taxa, or your temp, uh, species from temperate areas. So among these most diversity hotspots would be Mount Kinabalu in, Born, in, Borne, in Borneo, Gunung Rinjani in Indonesia, and Mount Wilhelm in Papua New Guinea. So again, to highlight the importance of the Cordillera region. So I, as I've mentioned earlier, Japanolojunia bakeri was also recorded in Mount Polis in Mountain Province. And the endangered moss, Marilio Brian Pabronioides, is uh, an endemic of the Cordillera administrative region. So the threat to the bryophyte that the region is currently facing now is habitat loss and habitat degradation, so as well as gaps in the current knowledge base and lack of bryophyte conservation awareness. So as researchers, um, the, the, the easiest thing to do among these four is the last two. So in response to this, uh, a doctor, a Dr. Napal Det and I were uh, collaborating on many researches in the Cordillera Administrative Region. And uh, one of this that he encouraged me to do is to do an inventory of the labor work in uh, in CAHOP in, in UPLB. So despite being uh, biologically explored, based on the records in CAHOP, these are old specimens way back 1970s, 1980s, we still found 20 species which are not yet recorded in the Cordillera Administrative Region and 18 species with new locality information. So I think what the labor work as of now are workers. So there, there are currently few people working on this, on this group. And then another would be uh, conduct, conducting field work. So uh, this is a uh, Dr. Napal Det, and we've conducted field work together with RA in, uh, in certain parts of the Cordillera region. And usually uh, it takes around one week in conducting these field work. And then for, I would like to highlight this portion. So we conduct introduction to bryophyte a lecture in the workshop. So this is in line with also with a lecture on basic vascular plant taxonomy, which is uh, which Dr. Napal Det is a is uh, discussing with other students. So the structure of this uh, lecture workshop: first, we have a lecture mainly introducing the biophyte to high school students, to university students, and then with. Uh, we teach them how to sample, collect, and process the bryophyte. And then during the workshop, they actually do collection work in vicinities, usually mga canal, irrigation, 
uh, batuhan and then we do some initial identification so this is a bit how uh, we are actually i'm teaching them how to fold the collection packet so this is part of the activity in sampling in sampling for bryophytes and then during the workshop the students will basically go around the vicinity of their area collecting bryophytes and then usually they would sort these bryophytes so here are the students examining the bryophytes collected in in their vicinity and one of the problems that we face in conducting this uh, lecture workshop is the rather lack of microscopes or working microscopes in particularly in public national high schools so i think it's uh, i think we need to improve on that so i i really find these students uh, 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 they are very curious on these bryophytes and they uh, they inquire on the identity of the bryophytes so unfortunately to due to the lack of microscopes um i cannot show to them what the structures of the leaves are but i adore their curiosity and then these are the participants drying their bryophyte specimens so basically i really think they enjoyed the activity And then, so that's the end for that part. So for the summary, so I just basically introduced the bryophytes and uh, did some, uh, a bit of overview on the bryophytes of the Philippines. And then I discussed, I, I, I shared stories rather of uh, experiences from Mount Mantalingahan and then uh, I took you on a tour in Mount Labo and oh I forgot actually to explain why the title is Aroma of Overcooked in a Pool. So during uh, during the conduct of that training lecture workshop, um, usually we, uh, we, we provide the food for the participants. So one of the RAs, nagsain siya, and then we enjoyed in the lectures. So ang nangyari nalimutan yung sinain. So nagulat kami may nangangamoy na sinain. And then yun, yun pala, may sinain pala. So I think it's it's a bit it's one of the subtle piece of life. Yun lang. So for the acknowledgement, um I I I really need na isa-isahin ko. So I thank my advisor Sir William Roezo and then my panel during my masters Sir Pat Magabigo and Ma'am Hatsal. And then in UPLB, the OPM group, Professor Giro Adorador, Zerilin Meneses, and Aileen Alcala. And then for, for Mount Mantalingahan, I would like to thank Kuya Tata Escala, Kuya Binoy Lumpon, Ipang Lima Reno Sindakan, and local field guides from Lansang and Aribungos. And then from Abasig Matogdon Mananap Natural Biotic Area, which covers a portion of Mount Labo, I want to thank uh, Forester Alex Maranan, who is the PASU. And then I also thank Choani Angeles and his son, Kuya Jun Konda, and the former barangay captain, Aborio Adorino. And then for Benguet State University, I want to thank Ma'am Ruth Batani, Dr. Jones Napaldez, si Rhea Loncho, and si Andrew B. Basbas, who are the RAs. And then in Kadaklan, I want to thank Ma'am Brenda Fiang Ryan and the teachers of Kadaklan National High School. So they were very accommodating. And then also Kuya Junior Chungalan of Kadaklan Homestay and as well as Kagawad Patrick Kulagan. So thank you very much for listening. Salamat, maraming salamat, dagang salamat. And I hope you enjoyed this a bit of lecture, something. So yun po, Kuya Flor. Thank you very much, Eugene. Uh, very informative, no? Uh, Nakatatlong sites ka na nag-discuss ka. And... Um, I think uh, before we proceed to the uh, Q&A and uh, let's give uh, some time to sa ating mga participants to formulate their questions. Let's let's just have a short quiz no as promised. Okay, habang naghihintay tayo for participants to, sa quiz maybe I could ask um uh, Eugene. Um I'll just throw in a question. Yung bryophytes of Palawan. Um 
I'm interested to know whether they are shared uh, biogeographically with uh, Borneo or other areas of the Sunda shelf. Um, actually, po, uh, based dun sa paper ni Dr. Tan, which is uh, it's quite an interesting find. Uh, mababa ang affinities ng uh, bryophytes of Palawan to Borneo. Mm. Mas mataas ang affinity niya to Luzon and other parts of the Philippines. Okay. So, but there are some elements from Borneo po na tumatawid to Palawan. Okay, thank you. So, okay. Uh, in, do you have more, do you have something to add, pa, Eugene? Uh, I, example lang po yung example po ng species na tumatawid pa kung Palawan would be your pinatela intralimbata. Mm -hmm. So ang extension lang ng distribution niya sa Pilipinas ay hanggang Palawan lang po. I see. So, okay. That's an example. All right. So I think we have around 20 participants now. Maybe we could uh, start the quiz. Okay. So first question, which of the following is the term used in the Bontok language for bryophytes and or lichens? Oh, may hirap na mag-pronounce uh, na ito. Forakhot, lumot, bagiw, and humot. And uh, uh, almost half of you answered uh, lumot. Let us uh, check. It's forakhot. Tama ba, Eugene? Uh, explanation rin lang po. Mm -hmm. So forakhot is actually a quite an old term. Mm -hmm. So I think hindi na siya masyadong ginagamit ngayon kasi mas widespread nang ginagamit yung bagyo. So yun. Okay. So yun, for a is the right term. All right. Thank you. So the next question is, who is the author of the first treatise on Philippine mosses entitled Mosses of the Philippines uh, published in 1939? Herzog, Stephanie, Brotherus, or Bartram? And ang maraming sagot ay si Bartram, 57%. Let's see. All right, 57% of you got it correct. Next question. Which species of liverwort is currently known only from its type locality, which is Mount Binuang in Infanta, Quezon? Mahirap din i-pronounce. <laughs> so I'll just say option A to D. And... Um, Neck and neck, drepanolehu. Oh, sige na, B and D. So the correct answer is it's uh, it's D, dentist, dentistipula. Diba? Mm -hmm. Bahat kaya dentistipula? Sa ano, no? sa, sa dentist, pinangalan? Hindi naman sa ganon, no? Hindi naman po. <laughs> All right. And... Um, Fourth question, which Philippine endemic moss is currently listed as endangered in the IUCN red list of threatened species? Option A to D. Bakit sila mahirap magpangalan ng mga moses, no? Uh, nakasanayan lang po siguro. <laughs> okay. 57% uh, of you... Uh, Answered Merillo Briaium Fabronoides. Let's see the correct. Okay, so it's correct. Fifth, option A. And the last question will be. Oh, parang ano? Which Philippine endemic liverwort is currently? I, I think ano yata nag uh, maliyata itanong. Tama ba Yuji? Tama po. Tama, okay. Which Philippine endemic liverwort is currently listed as endangered in the IUCN red list of spe uh, threatened species, Drepanolehuna becerai. 64%. Let's see if it's correct. And they are right. So maraming salamat. Let's see the leaderboard. Ah, secret. The secret uh, got five out of five uh, and answering everything in the span of 48 second. So, uh, yeah, may analytics pala tayo, no? which of the following is the term, uh, which the hardest question is, um, which, uh, itong question na ito, yung bontok language one. for bryophytes mm -hmm. and or ligand. So, secret, congratulations, maraming salamat for participating. Ivan, Patrick, 
Hermione and Charlotte. Probably there are mga pseudo names. All right. Okay, so let me just uh, stop my my sharing and let's proceed to the um, open forum. And then I think we may mga questions na rito eh, in the chat box. So um, the first question was uh, is from Daryl Salas, and um, uh, he's asking what classification did you use uh, for you know when you classified the mosses in your studies? I usually uh, classification. So usually there's a website. I used the website by Goffinet. I forgot the website, but I think it's in it's in University of Yukon. I think it's in Yukon. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've used. But I've modified some uh, for uh, for the sake na mas mapadali. Example kasi yung Yucobriaceae, yung ibang Yucobriaceae, sinasama na sa Dicranaceae. So for practical purposes, I used Yucobriaceae. Okay. So, so just for Okay, uh, would it be possible for you to share your ano, key uh, later on? Uh, ayong key po ni... You know, your classification? Hmm? Uh, classification system po? Or uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I can share it po. Okay, sige. So probably if you uh, if it's available, siguro pwedeng online or ano, you could just post it here in the chat box yung link. So uh, a, qu a question from uh, Sir Dave General. Um, Eugene, at high elevations, were you able to notice any ants under the mat of moss or bryophytes? Hmm. Usually po sa mga uh, ano po? sa colonies po nung Yoko Bryasi, mga Yoko Bryo, marami pong ants. Mm -hmm. Tapos madalas yun yung Ewan ko po inaano siya ng baboy ramo eh. Kinuhukay ng baboy ramo. Ewan ko kung may relasyon yun. Really? Okay. Interesting. So from John Calvin Clarete, um, he's asking, are there specific species of plants that an epiphylus liverwort loves to grow on? Specific species? So far, wala naman. So mm -hmm. as long as masatisfy yung requirements nila to grow on the surface of the leaves. So usually they won't grow on very smooth leaves kasi walang maangklahan yung spores. So yun, parang yun, so far yun lang naman yung ano, yung in terms of the leaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, incidentally, parang ano lang. Uh, you, may sinabi ka, you've, talk, uh, you've mentioned kanina yung parang uh, white mosses. Uh, right. So ano talaga siya? White siya? So I'm, in that case, uh, how do they no do their photosynthesis pala so for the leucobryaceae po or the yung mga members ng leucobryaceae mm -hmm. so the cells at the outer surface po ng leaves when you cut the cross section the cells at the outer surface are white so they don't contain any chlorophyll ah, but in, okay. in between those cells particularly sa gitna po nakahilera yun may mga chlorophyll cells din ah, okay. na doon so they can still photosynthesize so any any theories why uh, they evolved to, to be such the current white? Hmm. Uh, I haven't explored that. Hmm. <laughs> so I I can provide an answer right now, but okay. I will look into it. <laughs> All right, thank you. So uh, there's a, not actually a question from Mara Alfonso. Please, can I have a copy of this webinar, ma'am? Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be upload, uploaded to our YouTube channel. So visit our channel later, uh, maybe tonight or early tomorrow. Uh, just go to youtube.com slash UPLB Museum. Okay, uh, from Andrew Basbas Jr. Uh, from the University of Cordilleras. Are there bryophyte species which are, uh, which are being used medicinally? Hi, Andrew. Uh, kakilala ko po siya. <laughs> so, uh, species of bryophytes which are used medicinally. So, you have your sphagnum. So, marami niyan sa cordilleras. Uh, usually, ginagamit siya na uh, kunyari na kasugat ka pang tapal-tapal kasi it also has this antibacterial properties. And then, you also have your species of uh, uh, pogonatum. So, it has... Um, it's being it's being concocted in Chinese in traditional Chinese medicine, and 
though yung Marcantia polymorpha, I think it, it also has some medicinal uses. Mm -hmm. okay. Pero wala pa namang like, uh, you know, medicinal uh, use commercial. Nung, wala, wala pa naman. No wala extraction, no... Okay. Again, from John Calvin Clarete. Um, he's from UPLB. Most of the species... Uh, needs updating and what is the current situation in the study of mosses in the Philippines? Are there significant studies uh, done already in this uh, 21st century? I, so so far po in, uh, in the 21st century po, uh, particularly malaki yung development sa Mindanao po mm -hmm. kasi nandun yung may mga workers ng bryophytes from Central Mindanao University po so they uh, ano they have been publishing very significant findings from Mindanao. Po. And I've, uh, I've been uh, exchanging emails in the last week with Jim Sheba. He is one of the collaborators from C, uh, of CMU. He is from California Academy of Sciences. And um, I really find their field works in Mindanao very fascinating. All right. Thank you. So I think... Um... Question from Carlo Teodoro regarding the status of the other group of the other group under bryophytes. Um, is there enough studies of liverworts and hornworts in the Philippines? And what is the status? So for liverworts and hornworts in the Philippines, there are in terms of taxonomy so far, wala halos mababa. Kasi most uh, most of the specimens na from the Philippines ay tinitreat ng mga foreign workers kasi more or less the specimens are deposited in foreign herbaria. So, yun din siguro. Uh, may mga specimens naman tayo dito sa Pilipinas but wala rin, wala rin nagtatangkang gumalaw. So, yun. Mm -hmm. And then, another problem with this, uh, with the status of labor work taxonomy rin siguro is uh, meron si, uh, si Stephanie, who is a worker in the early early uh, early 20th century. So si Stephanie kasi he is not a he is not a professional biologist by training. He is, I think he is a merchant or a businessman. And then during his early years, yung mga na-publish niya na species ng labor works ay maayos pa. And then during his later years, nung nag, uh, parang nag-express na yung sakit niya sa, I think he has may sakit siya sa utak eh. Uh, eh hindi siya nagbali or something niya. May mm -hmm. something sa utak niya, yung nervous system niya. Nagkaroon ng problema yung publications niya kasi may mga species na na-publish na in the past na nire-republish ni Stephanie. So may mga napasamang Philippine species doon or maraming kasamang Philippine species doon. So yun yung kailangan pang isort kasi medyo makalat yun. Oh, so, siya. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Backtrack lang. Oh, oh, there's a question from Carlo Chodoro. Oh, no, no, sorry. Let me just... Nakita ko na yun eh. Ayun, Cedric Alguzar. Uh, he's from UP Diliman and based... He says, uh, based on your talk, bryophytes are identified and classified based on morphological, on their morphological features. Are there any studies on um, using DNA markers as basis for their classification? Uh, so for basis basis of classification, so if you will look into the works of uh, uh, the classification by Goffinet and then uh, in the resolution of a uh, taxonomic resolution of uh, the family Necaraceae of uh, mosses, may mga works na dun. So ang ginagamit nilang mark, particularly dun sa Necaraceae, ang ginamit na marker is I think TRNL, TRNL to TRNF and then ITS1, ITS2. Okay. And then, and I forgot the other one. Pero right. ginagamit na po siya. So at least meron ng uh, some sort of molecular work being done on bryophytes here in the Philippines right now. So uh, a question from Ronald De Leon. Um, is it true that some bryophytes are used or are used to help or can be helpful in filtering water? Filtering water. Hmm. Siguro ano ecologically lang siguro ito ang ang yeah. ang approach yeah. sa question. Uh, filtering water. Filtering water hindi ko sure kung paano sasagutin. Mm -hmm. Kasi kung 
uh, drinking water ba or <laughs> Uh, okay. So we will uh, we'll skip the question and Ronald kung if you want to clarify or uh, you know uh, um pagadayin yung question mo para masagot uh, feel free to put it here in the chat box again. So um we'll go back to Daryl Salas in your uh, study area are there species of bryophytes that are epiphytic um, particularly in mount Uh, mantalingahan, there are many epileptic bryophytes. So, yung pinakita ko kanina, ng Rakumitrium lanuginosum, they usually grow on rocks, or they attach to rocks, and then yung uh, species ng mga bryum, in the summit of Mount Mantalingahan, meron din. Mm -hmm. So, those are just some examples. And then, one example would be yung Philonotis from Mount Labo. It grows on, usually on rocks. I see. Thank you, Daryl, for that question. Um, okay, Ronald, you have this chance para uh, to throw in your questions. Are there any other questions from the audience while we wait for uh, Ronald's? Okay. So, habang naghihintay tayo, I think I have a question here. Let me just check what I've written. Okay. Um, yung, yung bryophytes that you have mentioned, uh, they seem to be uh declining in terms of uh occurrence uh i think i'm right uh, but is there a possibility of you know um in situ conservation or uh propagating them so far po i ang alam ko lang po na ex situ conservation ng bryophytes is done in europe mm -hmm. so, but so far in the philippines po wala pa akong narinig Wala. Pero possible siya. Like, um, possible it siya. will be some sort of grown and propagated in one place and later uh, reintroduced to to other areas that, uh, you know, kung saan siya dati nakikita. Possible din kaya yun? Uh, gin Alam ko po ginagawa nila sa Europe yan ngayon. Mm -hmm. So, I think it can also be done in the Philippines if we have the right resources. Mm -hmm. All right. So, a uh, question from Leslie Obiso, and he appreciates your work in reaching out, um, uh, reaching out the result to the students in your study areas. It's a good way of IEC or information education and communication for the protection and preservation of the bryophytes in the study area. Namat po. All right. So I think uh, wala nang questions, no? Um, Okay, before we proceed to the uh, end part of the program, let me just uh, do some uh, uh, let me just do some technical work. So um, let's give this certificate of recognition to Eugene Lawrence R. Logato. And um, this certificate reads uh, the Museum of Natural History, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension here at UPLB awards the Certificate of Recognition to Eugene Lawrence R. Logatok for serving as a resource person during today's 2021 Biodiversity Seminar Series um, session on Lumot Chronicles, re-exploring the bryophyte flora of Luzon and Palawan Islands in the Philippines, held today, June 23, um, 2021, from 10 to 11.30 AM Philippine Standard Time by Zoom. And in witness whereof, the signature of our director is here unto a fixed uh, signed Dr. Marian P. Dilean. So congratulations, Eugene, and maraming salamat for accepting our invitation. It was a very, very interesting uh, travel log. So maraming salamat. And again, uh, we are inviting everyone to check our website at mnh.uplb that edu that page or if you have questions comments or whatnot just write us at mnh.uplb at upi.edu.page please like follow subscribe um we are on facebook twitter youtube and um instagram just look for the handle uplb museum incidentally we are past 900 subscribers na sa youtube so please uh, help us achieve that uh, milestone that 1000 subscriber uh, mark and uh, check out our articles at wikipedia and tripadvisor just search uplb museum of natural 
history. So maraming salamat po. And then we are inviting everyone for our uh, fourth MNH Quincentennial uh, Commemorations um, Webinar uh, next Wednesday, June 30. And we have Professor Philip Alviola and Professor uh, Mam Jude Dimalibo talking about um, mammal explorations that have been done uh, during the Spanish period. So with that, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Ingat po kayo